For the people who like the periodic table of poetry pieces, like little periodic yeah. table here, um, I wrote a bunch of pieces while I was traveling, so these are crazy ones and I hope you enjoy them. Uh, I've got four or five pieces here that are short. This is number 61 in the periodic table. This is Prometheum. The end of the world just passed. Everyone thought that because the Mayans ended the calendar of 2012 winter solstice, that meant the world would end right then and there. We all waited with bated breath in confused anticipation, not knowing if we should feel a reserved, somber mourning, a sick, ignorant, religious end of days excitement, or if we should feel nothing at all. Did you know that Prometheus was the titan in Greek mythology who stole fire from Mount Olympus and brought it to the humans? Maybe that fire would be the end of times. Maybe Prometheus symbolizes both the daring and the possible misuse of mankind's intellect. Maybe the Mayan's calendar wouldn't do us in, but all of our own ignorance and abusive ways would. Maybe that end-of-world feeling that we got is from that rare decay of others that only produces that very unstable you, Prometheum. But the thing is, despite your issues, despite all the ways you may do us in, from radioactivity to your emitting of x-rays, we've learned that with just a little protection, we're safe through the next calendar cycle. Now we're better prepared, and you'll be the one wondering about the end of times. Thank you. Thank you. This is un septium. This is 117 in the periodic table. They don't even have a name for it yet, so it's 117 un septium. And so, <laughs> that's what it is. So. <clears throat> I knew you were out there for years, but to get you, after toiling in my Dubna lab, we had to ask the Americans over in Tennessee if they could send us some of their wares. But years passed before I could get 22 milligrams of berkelium so I could work in Moscow Blast to get you in my sights. All that time, all I could do was research, hope. I'd work, I'd go, and I'd stand on my own, and I'd leave on my own, wondering how long it would take before I would see what you might be like. You see, I used to work at the pharmacy at Nevsky Prospect in Leningrad. That's when I fell in love with learning about chemicals. That is when I wanted to discover something truly new. And that's when you came into the picture. Because after years of work, I still waited for those damn Americans to come through for us. I mean, we're scientists. We're supposed to be on the same side. This is all about discovery. And the thing is, the higher we get in our research, the more stable we got on our little island of knowledge. But this waiting course was exasperating. I got to the point where I got tired of trying to tell myself that I had something to discover, something to share that someone wanted to hear. Eventually, they had a ship, what I needed to get you in five packages wrapped in lead. It flew back and forth across the Atlantic five times and was rejected twice by customs. But once I got what I needed, no, oh, you were just about the heaviest thing I could imagine. And then again, you've had me spinning around over the years for you, so it wouldn't surprise me if you'd do the same for me. So I'd work while listening to the radio, and active actions from you would come to me in short bursts. But I'll take whatever I can get in my little corner of the world. This is research. And this is what I do to learn what I can from you. Thank you. <laughs> Strange coming up with voices, so I thought I'd come up with another one. Now I've done this element before, number two, helium. But while driving in one of my miniatures, I happened to see a compressed helium truck. <laughs> and I was like, I have to do with this one, I have to do a helium addiction. Since I lost my job welding cars, I thought I'd get my truck driving license and get my money on the open road. 
So when I applied for a truck driving job for moving compressed helium from California to Maine, they asked me if I could drive a truck. Or when I said I could, they, they gave me the keys. And those trucks are beaut with a bed of nine cylinders of that precious helium. I hear there's only so much helium on Earth, so I really had some precious cargo to haul. Now, since I love driving and know how to weld, I rented the tools and bought the tubing, and after Arizona, I had my rig set up so I could do helium hits while on the road. I mean, I had nine huge tanks of helium all compressed. It, it was like workers' comp. <laughs> you can always skim some off the top. They won't notice. So, this made New Jersey and Texas really fun. <laughs> and I ignored the winds sweeping down the plains of Oklahoma when I had my helium. But after Missouri, through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, the cops always pulled me over for erratic driving. But I can't let go of this helium high. The cops would ask me for paperwork and I'd happily comply. You seem to be driving erratically. Have you slept recently? Yes, sir. I'm just so excited. I, I love this job. And the cops looked at me funny before writing me a warning and sending me on my way. So I'd always look at my clock radio and limit my helium puffs every time I saw a good looking seat cover in a passing car. But those hotties were few and far between, so I'd check my clock radio and add puff every seven minutes. But when my helium hostage decided after only seven seconds, and I still had seven states before I could deliver my remaining helium, well, that's when I drove north instead to go through Michigan and, and leave my life in this country with my precious. And yeah, I, I'll miss my family and friends, but I've only scratched the surface with my nine lives of helium. And really, that helium high is worth the world. Thank you. Thank you. That was too <laughs> Thank you. Um, this one, I'm going to swing to something earlier in the scale. This is uh, magnesium, number 12. All this time, I've only known you from afar. Every once in a while, I'd see you in the distance while I was driving down the street. I, I may have seen you only 11 times in my life, and I know a part of you is essential in all of my living cells, but as I said, I've only seen you from afar. Once, I saw you outside my bedroom window where the first snowfall covered the land in a blanket of white. That's when I saw you walking outside alone, looking for your next meal. I know you can leave me with a sour taste, but I know you are needed in ATP, DNA, RNA, and it aches me to see you suffer, so... I, I think I saw you with your children as I sat out on the balcony of a father's house. I, I watched you in the distance, but I didn't watch you alone. Uh, after a while, someone said to me that you looked peaceful. But at another time, they would have shot and killed you instead. As I said, I only see you from afar, so I try to learn of how you were created from such large places at temperatures higher than anything we could imagine. I tried to learn, because one day I was told to go outside, and that's when I saw you lying down among the trees never to walk away from my home again. I've always only seen you from afar, and suddenly, as you lay there, I could see your organs shriveled and sunken in after your skin had pulled away as you wasted away. Uh, suddenly, I could tra trace your capillaries, and I could also trace your rib cage outlining your spine. I, I know that he created you. I know that you're highly flammable. And I know that when you start to burn, you're impossible to stop. 
You firebombed in World War II, and the only way they could stop you was by dumping a dry sand on you. Because you'd burn through the air, you'd even burn underwater. That's why you've been used in fireworks and in flares. That's why you've been used in illumination and flashes in photography. So they call this memento mori, I thought, when I grab my camera to photograph you in your final resting place. Because even though I've seen you, I've needed you, and I've known the damage you can do, I needed to photograph you right then and there. I'm sorry. I needed to photograph you this way. Do you have one for a tiny little one, or should I go on to our next? Oh, uh, is anybody interested in a tiny little one? Or yes, tiny, no? little, yes, no? tiny little. I got it. I got it. It says, it says a minute and a half is how long this one takes me. So this one <laughs> is lead, which is actually PB. I can't remember the number of it in the period. Oh wait, 82. I have that written down, but I just remember. This is lead. I walked into the bedroom. Opened the closet door, pulled out a cardboard box, then opened it to pull out a pistol case. I set the pistol case down, opened it, saw the unlo unloaded twenty-two and the filled magazine. I held the magazine, filled with lead bullets, reminding myself that it was always an option. There's so much more weight in those lead bullets. They feel heavy in my hand. Then again, lead aprons protect you from x-rays are heavy, too. Lead is so common, you used for thousands of years from the Bronze Age pushing the Roman economy. The name for plumbing even comes from the Latin plumbum because lead pipes were used. And after all these years, lead's not even used in lead pencils. <laughs> Those writing new pencils are just a lead mock-up, I guess. <laughs> because lead comes from the decay of uranium and sometimes could be radioactive. But still, it can protect you from things like x-rays or even nuclear contamination. So yeah, it can protect you. It can also be the missile in an instrument of death. As I said, these bullets feel so heavy in my hands. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And in between